So I have an Aegon Light 2. It's a little computer based around a Zilog EZ80 and an ESP32. Together, they create a working computer system that I can program. I like things I can program, especially when they're made from simple components that I can also understand. Modern technology is amazing, but it's too complex for one person to fully understand. Old computer architectures and modern microcontrollers are great for learning the fundamentals. And if you actually want to know what your computer's doing, you do need to learn the fundamentals. And these small devices are simpler to understand. There's a real sense of ownership over the device. You're not just slotting together modern computer like Lego pieces, as it were. That produces fantastic tools. You know, I wouldn't be without all this stuff. I don't want to live on a Z80. But building my RC2014, I knew exactly what all the traces on the board did. And when I was troubleshooting it, I really understood what was happening with the machine. Right down to the resistors. You just don't get that from a modern device. Nor do you actually need it. But, you know, understanding how something works so completely you can make sense of the circuitry in the CPU die itself just adds a whole new level of understanding and interest to the whole field of computing. As part of this fun journey of learning low-level skills, I'm also trying to make a game for my Aegon, using C. My alternatives are Raw Assembly or BASIC. Now, BBC BASIC is the best BASIC, and I'll fight in the comments if you disagree, but I wish they'd at least modernise it to no longer need line numbers. It isn't the 1970s anymore. And Raw Assembly is fun in small doses, but having to handcraft multiplication, division, and other fundamental features is just time-consuming. I've got other things I need to do with my life. The C compiler, though, is made for a Texas Instruments calculator that happens to have the same CPU as the Aegon, plus some extra code created by someone else that has proof of concept in its name. So we're already hacking things, and all I've done is gather the tools. This is my kind of development. There's lots of sharp edges to cut yourself on. The Aegon platform is open source hardware. I'm using the Aegon Lite 2 board from Alimax. There's an alternate version called an Aegon Console 8. The Aegon Console 8 has joystick ports. I want joystick ports on my Aegon Lite 2. I'm trying to make games, you know, players need controls. I discovered when trying to make a quick test concept that the Aegon's keyboard routines are purely for entering text, they're not for testing whether keys can be pressed. They just give you back character when it's pressed, similar to the basic in keys routine. You can't find out if two keys are being pressed simultaneously, or get the status of the whole keyboard. That makes games a little bit limiting, we need to fix that really. Additionally, writing code is a bit hard. It often goes wrong. This device has no debugging capabilities whatsoever. I can't hook up a debugger, and I can't step through the code. I could print text on the screen, except when I'm in a graphics mode, the text printing doesn't really work. It'll just print all over the game and be so large I can't read it. So I have a few challenges to figure out. I need to be able to add a joystick port, figure out how to test if multiple keys are being pressed, and implement some kind of debugging. And I don't really know how to do this, but it's going to be fun finding out. I'm definitely going to learn things along the way, and that's kind of the point. I think we'll start with adding a joystick port. It seems sort of approachable. This is my original joystick from the 1980s. I've somehow managed to keep it all these years. It was bought for my ZX Spectrum, then I used it on my Atari ST. You should keep your old stuff, it's important. These items exist to hang memories on, so you don't need to declutter your home, and you don't need to throw out anything that doesn't spark joy. Just in the crap you don't care about, keep the things you do care about. You don't have to live in a little white box that's minimalist. I care about the old computers I used to own, except my PCs. They're a bit disposable for some reason, so down there, sorry, but I'll replace you when you get too old. I like to keep my old actual computers though. Back in the 90s, I plugged this joystick into my Spectrum and spent hours playing games with it. Then I'd spend more hours typing out basic listings, learning some important skills. Skills that have stuck with me since then. Basic things, you know, such as being able to read large amounts of text, understand that text, and then pay attention to fine details that matter, and not give up when things get frustrating or confusing. I also learned what a basic game felt like. They were chunky character graphics, an input that felt very sluggish, or it repeated in that weird way that when you hold a key down, it kind of goes brrrr, and it's like you're just stabbing the key quickly. It's not like you just held the button down. I mostly learned patience and how to check through my code for errors because I made a lot. I was like six. And then calmly fix them without getting annoyed. Well, except that time a game failed to load and I unspooled the tape and just threw it across the room like a streamer. 
and maybe the time I punched my PC monitor, which really hurt, so I didn't do that again. Maybe the time I got so annoyed at an old mouse, I just like ripped the plug off and then immediately regretted it and tried to tape the wires back together. It didn't work after that. But anyway, after using this joystick on my Spectrum, I discovered it worked on my ST. I tried several times on my ST to learn C. I never got very far, but I did learn some more complex programming skills and I learned how to take my ST apart and put it back together again and still have it work. I still had this joystick when I acquired my first PC and I naturally wanted to use a stick on my PC. Not knowing any better, I looked on the back of the machine, I saw a DE9 socket and plugged the joystick in. Obviously it didn't work because that socket was a serial port. But you can kind of see my logic, it was the correct shape, a mouse was plugged into it, and on my ST, one of the joystick ports had a mouse plugged into it. The logic kind of made sense to me. However, which clueless kid plugs a joystick into a serial port and just expects it to work? Really, how stupid do you get? Current day me, much more intelligent. This joystick, by the way, needs cleaning. It's 30 odd years old and it's been heavily used, which is a great opportunity to explain how they work. What you're looking at is known as an Atari style joystick because Atari made the first ones and came up with the idea of using a DE9 connector as the standard. It's nothing more than a box of switches. That's it. No circuitry, just switches. Tiny little micro switches and they contain nothing more than some metal parts that make a contact. Over the years, the contacts get dirty, but after some scraping, they can be made to work again. How do I connect this to my Aegon though? If we look at the Aegon, it's got this row of pins, which might look like a traditional expansion connector you might find on a Spectrum or a user port from other home micros. The EZ80 is really a microcontroller, so it's got some extra functionality and it is designed to have extra circuitry attached to it. This makes it a bit unlike the real Z80, well, actually, this is a real Z80, made by Zilog. It's not a clone. It's not an FPGA reproduction. It's not a Raspberry Pi running software. It's not even new old stock harvested by people in China. So just imagine that. A CPU originally invented in the late 70s is still made today. Just don't use it for any life-critical devices, so no Z80-based pacemakers, please. Maybe that's why Terminators use 6502s. Being a microcontroller means it has GPIO pins, just like a Raspberry Pi's hat connector, just the same as an Arduino board. It doesn't have any memory or data bus connectors available in that way. Those GPIO pins are what are exposed on the external connector. So we can just connect switches to those pins and job done. No, really we can, that's literally what you do. You just build a simple little crappy adapter like this, and that's it. Of course, if you're building a professional device like the Console 8, you need to add a bit more circuitry. The Console 8 schematics show some interesting extra bits, like a level shifter and some ESD protection, so the pins don't literally go to the CPU core. I mean, who knows what rubbish people will plug into it. It is a D9 port, they could plug a modem in it by mistake. And actually that might work, because the pins used by the joystick include the pins used by the second UART port on the EZ80. So 12 year old me is pretty pleased right now. It's just 30 years before his daft idea of plugging a joystick into a serial port would actually be correct, technically. And to all the pedants in the audience, are you enjoying me consistently calling it a D9 connector and not a DB9? Told you, attention to detail is an important skill to learn. So is trolling people on purpose. So that's the hardware. What about the software? The Aegon's operating system doesn't have any provision yet for joysticks. But that's not a problem. This is a Z80. We can talk directly to the pins. They're set up in groups of eight via a selection of Z80 hardware ports. The Z80 has a design where instead of making everything be memory mapped I.O. like the 6502, it has an extra selection pin that when set, effectively gives the Z80 an entirely new set of addresses for talking just to hardware. The data sheet on the chip tells us which ones. I just need to communicate with ports 9E and A2 to read the state of each pin. It's easy. Although, how do I actually do that in C? In assembly, it's just a case of writing this simple code. However, we need to pad that out with a bit of compiler-specific fluff. What we get back is a byte that represents the state of a particular group of GPIO pins. In our case, it's GPIO C and D depending on the specific pins being used. Certain bits represent the state of our joystick. 
So with some simple Boolean logic, we can figure out which direction is being pressed. It's easy. Or in theory it's easy. There's always a catch. The console date schematics seem confused about which way the joystick directions go. And the UART gets in the way of some of the joystick pins. So you can't use the joystick and the second UART at the same time. The end result is something like this. A little joystick test routine that's pretty easy to add to a game. If you want this, it's in my GitHub, which is linked below. This is exactly why I like working with low-level hardware. Boolean logic, accessing hardware directly, and the potential to fully understand something is what gets my interest. I'd never survive writing Windows applications or trying to develop websites as a job. Piling obtuse APIs together isn't my thing at all. Let's continue the fun by trying to make the Aegon's keyboard routines a bit more useful for writing games. Ever since computers look like this, the keyboards on them have been an obvious way to control games. There's loads of buttons after all. Are you a modern WASD PC gamer? A more older arrows and control and alt id software gamer? Or were you more a QAOP user? Whatever you use, chances are you're trying to press more than one key at once. One of my favourite games as a kid was Rick Dangerous. I know, I was weird. And its controls require the pressing of multiple buttons at the same time. But this poses a bit of a problem. The standard PC keyboard has 105 keys. And trying to read the state of every key would require somehow scanning every single key to find its state and then storing that state somewhere for the programs to use. Most early computers didn't have that many keys but they also had their keyboards wired directly to the CPU's data bus in a variety of creative multiplexed arrangements. So reading the state of the keyboard was similar to just reading a memory location or two, and it was quite easy. For computers where that wasn't the design, the keyboard is attached to some electronics to turn it into a serial device, and serial characters were given to the programmer. The first method was done on machines like the ZX Spectrum and C64, where devices were mostly mapped into memory. It was quick, required little hardware, but required more code to translate the keyboard matrix into specific character codes and button presses. It also allowed programmers to find out exactly which keys were being pressed together. Unless the user pressed certain combinations that actually short out the keyboard matrix, but that's a problem that we still have today. The second method was the opposite, it required more hardware, but offered the convenience of being given ASCII codes. However, it's not possible to find out whether two keys are actually being pressed at the same time. Keyboards are difficult pieces of hardware to deal with at this level, you know, they've got lots of buttons and wiring. It's all transparent to the user and not so difficult for a programmer though, especially on 8-bit machines that we're dealing with. You see a typical boring application that uses keyboard inputs or a text terminal style interface where we type in commands. The programmer simply asks for individual keys and is often given back ASCII codes. This style of user input was all the rage in the 80s in basic games using the in key command. Some of the worst basic games in existence use this style of input. It was one of the defining features of early basic games. Did the screen appear in character sized chunks with no smooth scrolling? And did the user input suck? And until I modified the compiler, the Aegon is just the same in how it deals with its keyboards. The keyboard on the Aegon connects via this USB port, which isn't actually a USB port, it's a PS2 port. Just don't ask. I did, and it's supposedly a topic of some debate that happened. Personally, I'd have stuck a PS2 port on there, but what do I know? I didn't make the thing. And the ASP32 talks PS2 to receive the keyboard state, which it then sends to the Aegon's operating system, which is running on the EZ80. Sends it as character codes in ASCII. This is all inspired by the BBC Micro, but it's also quite a clever way of making a keyboard work on an 8-bit computer. I just need to make a small disclaimer. If I just insulted your favourite computer by implying its keyboard was crap, or I've somehow implied that all basic games were terrible, well, I'm not entirely serious. You should have figured that out by now if you've watched more than one of my videos. You see, in the synthwave neon past, we were just happy to have a computer of our own. And if it was only capable of stamping characters on the screen and treating the keyboard like an ASCII serial terminal, well, we didn't actually care. We had a computer, it was cool. Nobody really expected computers would play games with interactive, fast-moving graphics where human reflexes were actually part of the gameplay. Look at these fantastic programming books. These are the things that I lived with. All the games in them are text-based. The few graphic-based games in there are still non-real-time and just use remap to user-defined characters. This design was intentional. 
Drawing graphics was hard, and it needed a lot of memory, which early microcomputers didn't have. Combine that with video circuitry needing to access both the RAM at the same time as the CPU to get the image data, you can end up with lots of complex design issues, which each manufacturer tried to solve in their own way. The Spectrum had a ULA to handle it, the C64 had its VIC-2 chip, the ST had a bunch of shift registers, and a bunch of machines decided to mimic early mainframe machines by using ASCII terminal codes. Acorn, when making the BBC, which the Aegon is inspired by, took a leaf from Apple's manual and treated the video system completely separate as a serial terminal. The Apple I and Apple II treated their display and keyboard as an ASCII serial terminal. It was known and well understood technology in the 70s, and also generally the way things were done back then. On the Aegon, the ESP32 is a video subsystem, and it connects to the EZ80 using a UART serial port. It's known as the VDP, or Visual Display Processor. Same as the BBC Micros of EDU, VDU being an ancient term for screen and keyboard. This isn't a traditional UART though running at something like 9600 BPS. It's a high speed one that runs at something like 1.1 megabits. All the graphics commands are done by sending control codes to the ESP over the serial link. These are the same VDU commands in BASIC, and you can do the same with the print command in BASIC, or even the character printing commands in C. I always liked how the BBC has specific basic keywords for controlling the display that were just convenience functions, sending raw control bytes using the print statement. That's all that happens under the hood. If I want to draw a square on the screen, I don't manually fill in pixels in video RAM. I just send a draw a square command to the VDP and it does it for me. The keyboard is handled the same. The operating system for the Aegon has code that monitors the whole keyboard connected to the ESP32 and it'll capture the state of all the keys and store them in a bit field, one for each key. There's 16 bytes of RAM in the ESP, being used to store the state of the keyboard. Currently though, there isn't any code in the C compiler to interact with the Aegon's operating system to get out that keyboard data. And that's what we're going to fix by editing how the C compiler works. If I was coding in assembly, it'd be quite easy. In C, we need some glue and the glue needs to be a bit more sticky than what we previously did to read the joysticks. Although I think I'm getting some sort of weird interference from the future. Yeah, so, editing me here. It actually turns out that what I'm about to enthusiastically explain to you was added to the C compiler back in November last year. However, since I had a working compiler, I never bothered looking to see if anything had been updated to it. You know, you just sort of leave it when it's working. That's kind of the basic rule when you have a working development system. Leave it alone and don't mess with it, because otherwise you'll break stuff. But anyway, the next bit is actually quite fun, and it's incredibly nerdy. So, let's carry on. Yeah, that was a bit odd. But let's continue. Where was I? Um, keyboards. Keyboards. Right, so, like I said before, I was weirdly interrupted. The keyboard is PS2. So attach the ESP32 and sends ASCII character codes to the Aegon's operating system, running on the EZ80 when needed. Except I don't want ASCII codes, they're no use. I want the raw state of the whole keyboard, what buttons are actually being pressed down by the user. There's 105 keys on a PC keyboard, there's 8 bits in a byte. If you do the maths, as it were, you'll discover that that's just over 13 bytes. Turns out from some experimentation, there's 16 bytes allocated for this in the Aegon, and in the Aegon's operating system, there's a function. I just need to call it except I have no idea how to do this. So let's go for a walk through the compiler and figure things out to make this happen. When I want to interact with the operating system, I need to call specific functions. We'll follow one to see how the mechanism works. Here's some code to load data from a file. It calls something called MOSFread and MOSFopen. If you've programmed in C, they should sound quite familiar. So let's dig around and figure out how they work and then maybe we can work out how to get the state of the keyboard. Something has to exist with those names in the bowels of the operating system somewhere. So here's the compiler. It's a mashup of something called the CEDEV C compiler for the TI calculator. And then this set of files called AGDEV that add the functionality to the Aegon machines. You sort of copy the contents of AGDEV over CEDEV and it inserts a bunch of Aegon specific files and it works. I don't need to dig into the compiler itself, so let's just go exploring AGDEV. There's an include directory, and in there is a fairly obvious looking MOS API.h file. 
that I had to include in the C code that I was using earlier. It looks like a good place to begin. This is like basic finding information out by looking in headers. Inside that is a function prototype for MLS F open, but you'll notice it's declared extern. This is where things get a little bit difficult. In C, an extern function just means the code for that function is defined somewhere else. It might be in another C file. It might be in a library. It might be in some assembly linked in later. It could, in some cases, be inserted at compile time by the compiler itself. Fortunately for us, it's nothing too difficult to locate. If we do a bit of global text searching, our trail takes us into the lib, libc directory. And there's two files of interest. There's fopenc src and mosapi.src. Let's look inside the fopen file first. Some text searching reveals this giant complex looking fopen subroutine. I have no idea what's going on and I don't want to know. This is a rule you discover when you've been programming long enough. Some things like reverse engineering C files and finding specific pieces of code is worth your effort. Deciphering two pages of assembly, not worth it. But there's clues in here if we have a quick skim read. Partway through it, there's this line that calls MOS fopen. So this is just code to set up a call to the real fopen function. It probably does some stuff like validating parameters and setting up necessary structures for opening a file. Basic kind of housekeeping. Then the actual file opening is done by the real MOS fopen function elsewhere. So let's go and find that real function. That other file we looked at, mosapi.src. This file's different. The top half contains a lot of definitions of subroutines. Here's the fopen one we're interested in. But then further down, we find the actual subroutine itself. But again, it's more impenetrable assembly. Or is it? Let's just take a closer look. It's short enough we can probably make some sense of it. The comments help us figure out what general idea the code is trying to do. But what I'm more interested in is this middle part that says load A with MOS F open and then call RST with 08 hex. If you've done any ZX Spectrum assembly, you'll recognize this pattern of code. It's how you talk to ROM code on a Spectrum. You load the A register with a specific function call number, then you call RST, which is a bit like a jump instruction, but with some extra flair. So I think we've hit the bottom. This is the bit of code in the compiler that calls into the Aegon's operating system's code. We can stop it. We're done at the bottom of the rabbit hole. Remember, I'm not trying to write parts of the operating system. I just want to learn the mechanism to call bits of it. None of this code I'm looking at, though, is the operating system itself. It's merely the glue that binds C to the operating system. It's a similar concept to the glibc runtime on a Linux machine. What's MOS F open, then? It's just like this string of text. Well, there's another file, mosapi.inc. This file is some kind of table of function call IDs, and mosfopen is equal to A in hex. To recap, we're trying to work with the keyboard. This involves talking to the operating system. I'm not quite sure how to do that just yet. So we've been trying to figure out the mechanism for how you talk to the operating system at all. And we've discovered that what you do is, you first define the function call ID in mosapi.inc. You then write some assembly code in mosapi.src that ultimately calls rst 8 hex. You then write a C function prototype inside mosapi.h and then you profit. This is fine for MOSF open. We've figured out how that works. I want the keyboard though, but I don't know what to pass into the rst to call that. So it's time to go digging around a bit further and making some educated guesses. This is where another finely tuned skill of mine comes in handy. The skill of poking around and seeing what exists. I don't know what the code I want to call should do exactly, or what it is supposed to be called, but I know it'll involve the keyboard. And things seem to have been given sensible names in all of this. So let's go searching for keyboard related things, but not in the compiler. The compiler doesn't support this feature I want. That's why I'm doing this. We need to look elsewhere. This is where open source is amazing. Let's go look at the source code for the Aegon's operating system itself and see if we can work it out. The source code's on GitHub, just here. And if we do some educated clicking around, there's a keyboard.asm file that stands out. And inside it is a function with a suspiciously helpful name, keyboard map. This is the code we actually want to call. I know this because it seems logical. 
It's a bit of educated guesswork. It's got keyboard in its name. I also know these function calls in C tend to have the same MOS underscore whatever. And while scrolling through the files to see what else is there, this is a valid technique, by the way, for when you're lost and you literally don't know what you're doing, just scroll around looking at stuff. Things will jump out in your eyes. Well, here's a file called mosapi.inc. That stands out because there's one in the C compiler that I just saw a minute ago. And if I scroll through it, look, there's MOSF open with code 0A hex. We've seen that before, so we know we're in the right place. If we keep on scrolling, we can find out that there is MOS KB map, which is 1E hex. And that's what we need. That is like the code thing to call with RST. So back in the C compiler, we can add that to our own MOS API.inc. And we've done step one. Now step two, writing some assembly, which is a little bit more tricky. So let's fall back on another tried and tested method, following patterns and copying other people's code. Maybe I should become a web developer. First though, we need a bit more structure. The low level subroutine we're calling takes no parameters and it returns a thing. It has to somehow tell me the state of the keyword map. I don't need to give it anything. And from understanding basic C programming, I know it can't return a large lump of data. That's not how C works. It's probably gonna return a pointer. It's probably an unsigned eight bit integer pointer because that seems to be what this machine does. Let's look inside the C include file for something similar we can copy and paste. MOS sysvars looks like a likely candidate. It seems to match what we're doing. In fact, this might be good because getting the system variables from the Aegon seems quite similar to getting a keyboard map. It's gonna return like a thing of data that we want to look through. So while we're in here, we can add a prototype. And that's step three done. Now let's nip back into mosapi.src and work out this assembly code by finding the sysval subroutine and seeing if we can just copy and paste it and change a few numbers. My logic is that that's how it just works and it'll be identical to what I want and I just need to put different information in. So here it is. I've no idea what half this stuff means, but if we copy past it and change some bits, it should just work. Now, because I am just copying and pasting without understanding, it doesn't actually work. But with a bit of trial and error and some confused poking around until something worked, I managed to turn it into this. I just got here by trial and error, just by recompiling it and running it and it not working and occasionally crashing. And now this code works. I've no idea if it works properly, but it works. Here's a little C program I wrote that shows the state of the keys as you press them. And with a bit more trial and error and some simple bit manipulations, you can work out which keys are which bits. And then you've got a decent keyboard routine. Now remember, you don't need to know every single button on the keyboard. I'm only interested in like the arrow keys and maybe Z, X and C, and perhaps the escape key. So I can just press them and figure out which keys are which bits. Now, as my future self weirdly told us, this seems to have been added to the AG dev add-on that we're using. And if we look at what they did, the assembly is almost identical, which is really, really satisfying. If you can like invent something your own independently and then check it against what someone else has done that does the same job and it's almost identical, you've probably done it right by yourself. That is really quite satisfying. I'm not sure about the precise differences here because I literally do not know what I'm doing, ish. So if you do, Please let me know in the comments what the differences are between these two pieces of code. Is my code valid? Or have I just accidentally made use of some weird feature that I don't understand and it's just sort of working by accident? This is usually the point in these videos where we wrap up and I encourage you to come back next time, etc, etc. But no, we're not done. Let's keep going. Okay, this is a long video. You've just sat through this much. Your time is invested in it. So don't quit now because I'm not. I'm having fun. In fact, if you've got this far, you are watching the right place. You are supposed to be here. So it'd be really cool if you interacted with the video in some way to let YouTube know in its magical way that it's given the video to the correct people. It will then help other people like you because you do exist. They're in the comments. It will help them find this video. So far in what is turned out to be a pretty long video, definitely not made for the TikTok generation. 
we've plugged the joystick into the Aegon, read the GPIO using some assembly, we've dug around into the compiler and modified it to read the keyboard map, and we've learned how this works along the way. Let's finish off by adding a serial port for some good old text-based debug output, so we can print text to a terminal while our graphics code is doing its thing without spraying text all over the screen and making a big mess. This needs a bit more hardware. You need a USB serial widget. They're so cheap, just go buy a bucket full. They'll be useful one day. On the Aegon Lite 2 made by Olimex, there's this secondary connector. It's a thing they do with all their boards. It's got a UART on it, which in our case goes to the second UART on the EZ80. The first one is connected to the ESP32, remember. We can use the EZ80's other serial port for our serial output. Now this all started because I wanted to dev on the real hardware without having to swap SD cards with my PC just to load the data. It's that thing with real hardware. The process of compiling the code, putting the SD card into the reader, copying the code to the SD card, putting the SD card back in the Aegon, rebooting the Aegon, waiting for it to start up, loading the code was really, really tedious and I usually just use the emulator for 90% of the development I do. However, joysticks and keyboards need testing on the real hardware. There's an Aegon program called Hexload that lets you squirt code into the Aegon and run it through the serial port. My attempts at making this work late one night on Discord turned into me using this as a debugging port instead. I got Hexload working once, then it just stopped working and I decided to go to bed instead. I have fantasies of making my own Hexload type thing but giving it a bit more features, a bit like DZOG for the ZX Spectrum Next. We'll see. I don't want to get too distracted. I'm supposed to be making a game. Back to serial port debugging. Remember at the start of the video, about three weeks ago, my story about this joystick and me plugging it into my PC's serial port, expecting it to work? Well, if we look at the EZ80's pinout, we can unfortunately see that two of the GPIO pins share the pins with the second UART and that's where we've plugged in the joystick. I don't know why but whatever we'll go with it. The second UART is a bit niche I guess so I just suppose this is how the hardware was designed and we we live with it. We write software we deal with the weird hardware things but we'll ignore that and carry on. Just don't click the joystick when sending characters to the screen it screws everything up in a pretty funny way. This will need a bit more work when I use it for real like I'll need to pick other pins to use for the joystick while testing code. I can do that on the Olivex board because I've got all the pins laid out. I'm not sure what you'd do if you've got a console 8 machine because I don't think they've got the extra pins anywhere, I'm not sure. But talking to the UART on the EZ80 is quite easy. If you're using the official C compiler, it's got full support baked in. We're not though, we're using some hacked thing made by other people. However, the official compiler can help us quite a bit if we look at its C headers and its examples to see what they do. The official compiler knows how to talk to its ports directly using the previously hand-waved magic compiler glue concept. So I had to replicate that using a C function to set the Z80 ports and their data. Along the way was a lot of confusion. Some of the magic code that I got also came from the Aegon Hexload utility, which is written in C and assembly, but it's written for the, the real C compiler. So I had to lightly edit this and just kind of beat it until it compiled with AGDev. And it was mostly a case of renaming things and defining lots of stuff that was missing. None of it was hard, but it did involve a lot of trial and error until I'd done it so wrong so often I eventually had to do it correctly or just give up. And just like you watching, we don't give up easily. You don't have to be particularly smart or excessively dedicated to do stuff like this, you know. It's just like most things. If you're just a little bit harder working than average and you persevere a little bit more, you'll be better than average. Because if it was easy, everyone would do it. This would just be like a thing. Also, it helps if you're a bit naive and don't think tasks through fully before starting. Sometimes just jump in and start because if you know it's difficult, you might not even begin. So there you go. I think this video is probably quite long and certainly very technical. This is a kind of development that I really enjoy though. Wanting to do something, thinking it's probably too difficult to complete, but eventually figuring it out is so rewarding. It was just complicated enough that I needed a bit of guidance from the super helpful people on the RMC Discord server's Console 8 channel. 
but not so much that I couldn't figure it out all by myself. And none of this was horribly obtuse or required arcane knowledge that was commonplace 30 years ago that I didn't know because I was like 7. Now I've got some nice basic functionality to get keyboard controls, do some debugging and use a joystick. Next time, we're off trying to figure out what game I should even be making. I've got some ideas. And to try and get some moving images on the screen. That'll be fun too. It'll involve some chat GPT written Python because I'm a lazy person. So... Until then, I'll see you next time.